so the first f- pushback I always get is, but wait a minute, haven't we all heard that Christians divorce at the same rate as everyone else? And so the researchers went back to the data and they made that important distinction that you just mentioned. They said, okay, there's, there's these committed Christian men, but what about nominal Christian men? So now my, my students don't even know what that word means. So I have to tell them uh, nominal N O M is Latin for name. So it means in name only. And these are men who on a survey like this might check the Baptist box, for example, uh, but who actually attend church rarely, if at all. And these men test out shockingly different. They they fit all the toxic stereotypes. They, their wives report the lowest level of happiness. Um, they spend the least amount of time with their children. Th- these couples actually divorce at a higher rate than even secular men, 20% higher than secular men. And they have the highest rate of domestic abuse and violence, even higher than secular men. So this is why the statistics get so skewed, because if you just say evangelical or Protestant or Christian, you're going to get men who are better than secular men, (laughs) men who are worse than secular men. And so the numbers are going to be misleading. And so this was the first time that that researchers actually separated them out so that we can understand what's happening. And yet, like you say, it is the nominal Christian men who are therefore, and in the West, we have a lot, we have a lot of sort of cultural Christians who don't really believe it in a personal sense, where it's just that cultural background, family background. And um, the one study I found that gave the actual numbers, it's about the same same size, the same number of Christians on both sides. And so a lot of people are getting the negative understandings, the negative view of Christian men from these nominals who, in fact, are worse. By the way, some people ask me, why would they be worse than secular men? And the answer seems to be that a secular man who is maybe hitting his wife and kids at least does not feel any religious justification for what he's doing. But the nominal Christian man is hanging around the fringes of the Christian world enough to pick up language like headship and submission. Um, He infuses those words with meanings from the secular world, but he feels religious justification for what he's doing. And then he ends up being the worst having the worst the worst of both worlds right he ends up having the christian language but behaving worse than secular men so this is a challenge uh for churches for example you know how on the one on the one hand how can you use this data to really encourage the men who are doing well over against you know a very hostile environment you know in terms of the, the secular world thinking that christians are like you said attacking christians as being the worst uh of the uh, of the toxic men. But on the other hand, how can Christians reach out to these men at the, at the fringes? You know, is there a way to have a discipleship program that reaches out to them and says, you know, you need to get a biblical understanding of these terms. You know, you you are out there, you know, in a sense, creating a negative reputation for Christians because you're not actually living it out. You're actually living out a secular view. And by the way, that's another reason that I wanted to write this book, because what is the secular view? So that we can have a critical grid, right? If you don't know, if you don't have a critical grid, you will just absorb ideas from your culture. Uh, and so we need a critical grid that helps us to distinguish between positive, healthy masculinity, um, you know, from, from our cultural, the, the cultural scripts of, like you said, the real man. How can we distinguish them and make sure that we, what we're following is a, a, a biblical pattern and model? And so can you just unpack a little bit as to how that biblical model should work and why it is a superior model that you've dem- you've already referred to the research showing that people who who are who take their faith seriously and follow it to its logical ends produces the happiest wives i mean that's the happiest women so that's pretty powerful what is it that we need to critically understand that that flies in the face of those who would say this paternalistic idea of male headship and responsibility um, that's so damaging. What's the? Can you sort of come to the the kernel of a right understanding that changes behaviour and re- reflects a better way? Yeah, because let me um, put it in context. Because I uh, in the churches today, you hear two sides. You hear on the one hand that uh, you know that, that men are like you said overbearing and and entitled. But you also hear a lot about how churches feminize men. You know that they tell them you you know you should be you should be nice and passive, and so we need a biblical view that uh, counters both of those. And what I do in the book is I come back repeatedly 
to the concept of the cultural mandate. Um, you know, ma- many people think Christianity is just about going to church on Sunday and, you know, maybe a Bible study and, and, and um, you know, personal morality. But scripture starts out in Genesis with a much bigger, much broader vision for both men and women, but we're talking about men here. And the, the cultural mandate is a term that theologians give to Genesis, where God has created the universe, he's created the animals, and then he creates the first human. And what's the first thing he says to them? He says, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. In other words, he says, why did I create you? What's your goal? What's your purpose? What's your job description? And in the streamlined language of Genesis 1, we can unpack that so that um, there's many layers. Be fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean have a family. But historically, all of the social institutions grow out of the family. Right? It becomes a clan, a village, a nation. And you need social institutions for particular purposes. You need a government. You need a church, a, sta- a, a school, a marketplace. And so it's a very rich um, understanding of men Men are being called to f- fill, uh, build up the entire social world. And subdue the earth means harness the natural resources. So that means, well, most cultures start with agriculture, but then mining and technology and uh, building buildings and inventing computers and composing music. And one of my students said, oh, oh come on, composing music. So I said, I play the violin. What's the violin made out of? Wood. <laughs> What's the bow made out of? Horse hair. So all the transcendent beauty we associate with music starts with harnessing the raw materials of nature. And so what we need to do is help men recognize that this is the rich goal that God has put before both men and women. It's much, um, much richer than just, you know, well, did you go to church this Sunday? It's saying that your calling is to, it's called the cultural mandate because the calling is to build cultures. You know, to create civilizations, to make history. And that's a big enough vision to really match men's desire, their aspiration to have an impact, you know, to achieve mastery, to accomplish things. Um, and it's, it's, I think men are built with a desire, you know, to have that sort of a challenge. And a full Christian worldview does give that sense of masculine challenge that I think that fits fits what men really need in terms of having a goal and a purpose and a meaning to life. 